Can I start? Oh. Can I? Okay, okay. <laughs> Alright, cool. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Vito Chin. This is uh, JS Adventures in Angerland. Um Thanks for coming. So, um, Adventures, what does that mean, right? Um, so, uh, uh, can we do a retake? This mic is really loud. Hello? Now? Better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, JS Adventures in Azure Land, what, what, what is it about, right? So, really, um, it's less formal than uh, my, colleagues's, uh, my colleagues' talk. So, it's really about the things that I'm doing and uh, some of the less uh, normal things that I do with Azure, right? Uh, it's a little bit different, a little bit weird, uh, but I'll let you be the judge of it, okay? So, uh, I'll, I'll start. So, a couple of uh, intro about myself. I am a cloud solution architect for Microsoft. So, my day job consists of uh, working on, uh, with partners, Microsoft partners on blockchain, app development, and uh, general uh, Azure stuff. Uh, I code. So, I maintain a, a graphic manipulation library in PHP <laughs> called Gmagic. I've been doing that for 11 years now. Uh, yeah, so that's PHP, but this is a JavaScript conference, but uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, I also do some personal finance uh, coding. Uh, so around Ledger CLI, if you've heard of it. So I do uh, like a Electron, I mean not Electron, not WebKit app around uh, Ledger CLI. Uh, so, so that's for fun. And I also started a uh, automation package for um, kind of like uh, it's kind of like a cron for JavaScript. So I presented that uh, about in JSConf 2016. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like my open source uh, kind of like uh, endeavors. So I also uh, created a book based on Bertrand Russell's Conquest of Happiness. So it's really just taking uh, that book and uh, infusing some uh, pictorial illustration of uh, what Bertrand Russell was trying to explain. So, yep, let's dive in. JS in Azure Land. So we're going to start with uh, the entrance to the theme park, right? How do users, how does user actually get into your app, right? So most apps today, you need to log in, right? Or you need to be authenticated somehow. So, um, so yeah, the first topic is about Azure Active Directory and, and, and how to work with it, right? So, there's, there's uh, libraries like uh, ADAL, ADAL, Active Directory Authentication Library. Uh, and and uh, so, I'm not using that. This is a different way. And um, again, like I say, this is like an adventure, right? So, um, you can have a look and see if uh, this is uh, suitable for your projects. So there is a very specific uh, subtlety that required a, a different way, uh, as I will explain in a while. So why Active Directory, right? Uh, I presume some of uh, you may already know. It's easier, to, it's easier than managing your own uh, user base and identity system. Uh, it's scalable. Obviously, it's on the cloud, so you know it's not. It's not constrained to a server, and it's also um, very well integrated with uh, enterprise SSOs and, and, and such. Okay, so the traditional workflow for Active Directory looks like this, right? The user comes from a browser, it goes to, a, it gets redirected to a authorized endpoint, so that endpoint returns an ID token which is then passed to a web server. The web server then does more job, more work of actually getting uh, the, the token, another token from uh, an API that you can actually use to communicate, to actually make API calls to the backend server, right? But I wanted to show something different. So if you're looking at that, yeah, that's totally fine. So what I'm showing here is uh, basically a React-based use of Azure Active Directory. So what does that even mean, right? 
I needed uh, I needed a, a framework. I needed a, a, a platform that I can teeter on, right? So I found uh, Jason Watmore's uh, JV, JWT uh, off example. So uh, I have not, not met this guy, but uh, I found this on GitHub, right? And uh, I think he's Australian. But anyway, so he did a really good example of uh, logging in from a React app. So as you see from the left side, there's React Redux. Uh, JWT authentication example, so perfect for me. So, um, React is uh, very prevalent these days. Like you know, we get a lot more React even for intranet applications. So, so I actually found myself in this situation, but I needed a, a publicly demonstrable uh, platform. So I, I'm using this. So what you see on the left is a Redu uh, React Redux JWT authentication, and what you see on the right is a Node JWT authentication. So how, what happens is um, the front end actually serves uh, the form for the user to log in. So the user uh, inputs the username and password as per you know, user practice, and that username and password gets, passed, uh, gets posted to the back end. The back end uh, authenticates the user and returns a JWT token. So very vanilla things, right? Um, so my my challenge, right, why I'm doing this, why, why this adventure, right, is because of a specific requirement. So the developers, uh, for example, in this case, uh, this particular React app, we, I, I was thinking, you know, if I could find a way to not modify the existing way that the application does uh, authentication, you know, getting a, a user into the private parts of the application, uh, and I wanted to keep that process while wrapping around Azure AD so that uh, users, existing users that are logging in with uh, username and password can do so and people can have the additional option of logging in via um, Active Directory. So um, the crucial part here is it's not like passport or anything. This is a, a custom-based username and password authentication. So again, this is, this is not passport. If you, do, if you use passport, you can just use passport, right? But if you find yourself in this situation where, okay, I already have username and password and I need to kind of like wrap Azure AD around, yeah, this may be interesting to you. And even more interesting is, is what I'm using to do this, right? So I'm using this thing called uh, uh, a state parameter, right? So state is a parameter that Azure AD actually accepts to uh, maintain a shared knowledge between the browser uh, Azure AD itself and anywhere else that the, the, the user gets redirected to. In this case, the, it, it, get, it gets redirected to the backend. And you may not necessarily want to redirect the user to the backend. You can redirect the user to like, some other web service. Or, so uh, if you think about Azure AD, right, and if you think that it is uh, you know, something constraining, it's not actually. It's just, uh, it's just a, a, an endpoint there. And you can actually redirect to anywhere you want and, and do things with it. And this is one example how that is done, right? So moving on, if you want to check out my uh, code, uh, it's actually available on my GitHub uh, here. And let's get started. So before I make any mods, right, uh, here's how the app looks like. You log in and then, yeah, you know, you're logged in. <laughs> Simple, right? So. This is the existing code, right? Without the modification, right? And because React is so component-based, I actually added like wrapper components to make it easy, right? So the existing code uh, remains minimally modified, right? There are some parts I added a link here and there, right? So, uh, so those parts I cannot prevent because I need to show the link on the front page. But I can show you how uh, with components I actually can wrap things around, and and you know with this I can actually achieve the you know the outside loop that I was showing just now. So yeah, the existing action is very simple. You know, the user logs in. Uh, the the action actually eventually results in a post to the backend with the username and password in the body, right? So in the body, I mean, in the when it's posted to the backend, what the backend does is this is just an example, right? There's an array there, and. Uh, what the, what the backend does is it uses the username and password that's uh, posted from the user. It actually uses that to find from the array. And if you find something, uh, 
create a token and return the user object and the token along with the user object. Simple, right? So what I want to achieve is after after wrapping around, right? When the user wants to log in, it has the option to yeah go to Microsoft uh, uh, login Azure AD login, and if it's already signed in, you know it will just go to the app, obviously. So so that's what I want to achieve, though. Yeah. So okay, let's get on to how I want to achieve uh, this, right? So here's the first part of my mod. The first thing is uh, with Act Azure Active Directory, right? Obviously, you need to have uh, the tenant ID and the application ID specified. Okay, so I'm actually actually just putting this in a in a constant over here, and also we need the redirect URL. So here I'm using uh, a local host. You can actually place any redirect URL, uh, but if it's external, it has to be. I mean, if it's not kind of uh, local, it has to be a secure HTTPS endpoint, right? So you can actually redirect this anywhere. Uh, and here I am actually redirecting to local. So moving on, where do I get those things? The tenant ID, application ID, and the redirect URI. So you get this when you actually create a, uh, an, an app instance in Azure AD, right? So here, I'm, here in app registration, you can actually see application ID, tenant ID, and the redirect URI uh, over in the Azure portal. So getting this. Uh, I placed it in the constants in my uh, React app just now. So all of that, right, actually is just to assemble a redirect URL. So what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a helper to construct the redirect URL to uh, Azure AD. Okay. So then I add a a, uh, a route to my app. So this is app.jsx, right? So this is my main uh, React app component, right? So I just add a route, nothing very uh, fancy here. But the route, if you notice on line 35, the route actually redirects to the off URL that I created with the helper just now, right? So what this means is if the user hits a browser and you know it, it, uh, uh, she does slash off, uh, she will get redirected to the Azure AD login. So the private uh, routes, right? So parts of the application that are private, um, you will actually go to this uh, specific component. So what this component does is it actually gets a user uh, object from local storage, meaning your browser, the local storage on your browser. So if you notice earlier, right, with uh, the Jason Watmore's example, right, a login user uh, has a user object returned to the browser and, and it actually stores this, right? So the presence of uh, a user object indicates that the user is logged in and is authenticated, right? So if the user is authenticated, we will show the component, you know, whatever the user is requesting. And if it's not, then, you know, we redirect to uh, the login page, okay? And uh, at the login page, uh, here, as I mentioned, I can modify and wrap around, but this is one part that I couldn't wrap around because this is just a link. I need to show an authenticated uh, and off link to the user. Obviously, I cannot do this as well. I can, you know, redirect straight away as well. It's uh, it's really up to me, right? But here, I want to just add a link at the bottom of the login page so that hey, you know, log in with AD, right? That's an option. So yeah, now let's uh, talk about the state parameter that I was using, right? Um, so as I mentioned, I was using state to do this, and and and, and it's really a wrap around without really modifying uh, the the application, right? But this state is really where the magic happens. Okay, if you read part of this uh, this paragraph here, the state can be a string of any content that you know that that you wish, right? So you know, I wish for the content to be a uh, some kind of a unique ID. Uh, it basically, it's like a hash string, right? So it's a unique ID that's generated at the browser, and uh, we'll see what happens to it, right? So that's the state part. The state, again, just as a reminder, gets carried around the whole uh, authentication uh, flow here, right? Uh, yeah, so as, you, as I mentioned, the state gets passed to the Azure AD as a parameter, and Azure AD then uh, once authenticating the user passes it on to my backend that I specified as a redirect URI. Okay, so 
the back end, upon receiving the, the state, right? Remember, the state is actually stored in the local browser, in the browser in local storage. Now, the state has arrived at the back end. So, I need to add a route to receive the state, right? So, this is the route that uh, I will actually place in the redirect UI, getting that state. And this is just a controller, you know. So, the controller actually sets the, the, the state, um, the token. So, when I actually do this, right, the, I, the oh, Azure Active Directory actually passes an ID token to uh, my, uh, my backend over there, right? And also along with the state. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the state as the key to local storage. So I'm using local storage here on the server side. It's just a simulated local storage. It's just for persistency, right? But uh, it's pretty nifty, so I really like this, right? Uh, so what I mean here is I, know I, I just want to store this somewhere with a key, right? And the key is... Uh, the state hash, okay? So I'm storing the ID token now, and I redirect the user back to the front end. And upon uh, getting this on the front end, uh, yeah, so one thing to note, I, Jason Watmore's example actually has this mock, uh, mock backend on the React app itself. So this is just for convenience. Um, you know, if you just want to run that React app, you don't need to run the backend, and you can actually simulate the login. But uh, in this case, we actually do have a backend. So, so yeah, but so we'll uncheck this, uh, just as a note, okay? So now we have a state on the front end, right? So with this state, I can actually get my front end, my React app, to authenticate with my back end uh, normally, right? I say normally, but you know, normally meaning it gets a normal, uh, the existing token that the app already uses. So what I mean by that is, uh, uh, practically, I'm passing in the state that I've stored. Remember, I've stored a state before I redirect the user to uh, Azure AD, right? So now I have the state. I retrieve that user object, and I'm actually using that state uh, hash to log in. So log in with state, and you have login with state action here, uh, which is really um, just a, a, a very standard uh, React action. And here's where the magic happens, right? The, the state gets full, uh, full through to the post request, and I'm, instead of username and password, I'm actually passing in the state as the, as the body of the request. Okay? And uh, the, uh, the endpoint that I call is different. It's now um, state off, which is you know, to authenticate with state. So passing in to the endpoint now, uh, to the backend. The backend then uses the state. Remember, I've stored this earlier in the backend, right? So the backend now uses the state to retrieve the, the, um, the ID token that is stored with that hash, okay? So with that ID token, uh, here's where, where the user objects get created. So with that ID token retrieved, and I find that, oh yeah, this user actually has an ID token. It's not like some uh, unknown user. It's already an authenticated user. I use the ID token. I, I decode the ID token. I obtain some of the data from the token and use that to construct the app's actual JWT token and return that JWT token along with the user object as per normal. So, so yeah, now we get... So I hope not you see you know, how uh, the existing kind of like protocol of the app logging in with this token creation is actually preserved. Okay? Uh, yeah, so, so that's that, right? The flow is done. Uh, a couple of uh, security considerations if you, are, you know, if, if you are keen on using this technique. Um, so one of it is here. Uh, remember that you know, the user actually claims his ID token uh, with a state, right? So one thing to note is when, he actually, when the user actually claims that token, remember to expire that token, you know, uh, destroy the token. This is to prevent the token from being uh, caught, from being uh, retrieved uh, by any other users, right? So this is just uh, kind of like hygiene, right? So other considerations uh, are there as well, right? Um, yeah, I'll jump over here. So there are other considerations. So this is the uh, token expiry thing. Um, there are other considerations, okay? So remember that we were using um, this endpoint, right? This uh, specific endpoint slash uh, token. So we don't want to really um, allow brute force attack on, uh, on slash token and slash state off. 
So what you want to do is uh, do some rate limiting there. And uh, Azure API management actually has uh, a mechanism that helps you to do rate limiting or even to block out any unwanted requests from uh, non-relevant uh, endpoints or, or you know, endpoint, uh, hosts or nodes in the flow. So one of the flow here is Active Directory actually goes to the back end, right? So you, you will not want to have any other people calling, any other nodes calling uh, to slash token, for example, besides uh, Active Directory service. So that's one thing that you can restrict. Uh, yeah, actually I skipped a couple of other stuff here, but it's not really... Um, remember earlier, I was, I was saying that we need to actually uh, lock the user out, right? And here's how I'm using a React component as a wrap. So um, the Jason Watmore's original, um, original example, right, uses the login component to do a logout, right? So what happens is uh, in the login, comp login page constructor, it calls a dispatch. It dispatches a, a, a logout, right? But, uh, which is cool, you know, but I needed the, the, the logout uh, action right actually does uh, it actually does this it removes the user object but I need to do more right so because I now have a state object so now I wrap around uh, login page I extend uh, I mean I create a logout page I wrap around uh, the login page okay as you see the render is actually a login page rendered and from there I do a state logout so the state logout actually removes that state. So when the user actually goes to the logout page, it gets a clean slate. There's no more uh, any entity stored in uh, local storage. Okay. So yeah, that's uh, the that's one part of the the adventure done, right? So around Active Directory logging in and all that, uh, uh, alternative way of uh, dealing with it. Uh, yeah. So this is quite raw, you are just using React and uh, just some calls, there's no library that you are using and all that. So if you're keen, you know, you can check it out, it's on GitHub, right? So the next thing that I want to go to is, is, is storage, okay? And, uh, and there's also a kind of a unique way of using storage. As, so what I wanted was, I was not happy with, you know, just looking at the portal. I wanted to actually get that data. As a Node developer, you know, I love my JSON, right? So I want everything in JSONs. <laughs> So, yeah. So there are many storage available in uh, in in in, uh, on Az in Azure. So there's uh, Azure Database and etc. Right. Um, but my favorite storage is actually Azure Table Storage. Okay. Uh, and I like it because of uh, a couple of reasons. So first, it's really convenient to use it. Right. There's no. Uh, although it's called Table Storage, the tables are not really uh, structured. Right. Like there's no. You don't need to define this. I mean, you don't need to define a table schema or like you know pre-existing structure for the table. You can just dump any entity into it, and it will the table will adapt to the, you know to whatever you dump into it, which is <laughs> very convenient for me, right? The next thing is it's really super affordable. Uh, if you think about it, right, this is the uh, this is one storage on the cloud, right, that you can store things. And you're just charged by like the megabyte, like you know, like similar to blob storage kind of uh, pricing, like almost similar. And you don't need to like ha turn on a compute that needs to be per you know turned on all the time. So things are like you know you just charge like a uh, per transaction, right? And you get a lot of uh, tran free transactions to start with in, in any case. So yeah, so I've been running this for some of my apps, and I haven't been paying anything actually. <laughs> so so I really like this. Um, Uh, so I'm going to show how I use Azure Table Storage. Right? I use it for all sorts of things, right? I use it to keep track of all sorts of things, uh, personally and at work. But I'm going to start, uh, get on with it, right? Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, why, how, one story of how I'm using it. So, um, so this is a Visual Studio Code page, right? So it's not really relevant to my story, but <laughs> what I want to tell is, uh, if you go to this page and if you click on Download, what typically happens is you get redirected to another page, right? And within that page, there's some JavaScript that gets you to where you actually want to download things, right? So I think people do this because uh, they actually want to do analytics on like, people downloading their stuff. Um, so 
Uh, I'm cool with that, but I wanted something even deeper than this, right? So, what if, my, my, my question is, what if, uh, you know, I go to my portal and I download this, so it's not tracked, right? And what if people go to the endpoint directly and do a download and it's not tracked? And what if this is like a private thing, you know, like uh, there's, uh, it's actually a private blob, right? And, and, and it's not tracked as well, you know, if it goes to a page, right? Unless, so I wanted something that is even at a lower layer and, you know, even more accurate than uh, page-based analytics. So, um, yeah, so I went to read, you know, the docs and I realized that, yeah, you know, Azure actually provides, uh, Blob Storage actually provides uh, an API. Uh, and the actual API that people are actually calling when they actually go to get a blob is actually get blob, right? Um, but when I tried to chart it, so this is May 14, 2019, not that long ago. So this is something recent that I was doing, right? Um, so I went to Azure Portal and I tried to chart it. And yeah, it's not there. So... Uh, yeah, so I was uh, slightly disappointed, but you know, I was, uh, I made a little bit of noise with my team and I don't know, like some magic happened and on 31st of May, uh, 2019, and I went back to the same chart and you know, the get block API is actually there. So, so this is me, I made the, the one download and you know, there's one download there and I actually get my chart, which is cool, but uh, I wanted something more because as a Node developer, I want my JSON. I don't just want a chart. And, you know, with JSON, I can do all sorts of stuff with it. And what if I want to have, like, you know, some of the other metrics? Because now I know that, ooh, there's so many other metrics that I can play with. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, aside from that, there's also some constraints, right? These metrics, right, these charts that I can do, uh, it's only doable for up to 90 days. This is because the retention period uh, is 93 days, but you know, it's extendable. There's some ways which I'm going to show, but uh, yeah, if you do nothing, you know, it's there for 93 days for platform metrics. Uh, certain resources, they do some diagnostic logs as well, and the minimum for that is 30 days, but you can configure that. Or, you know, for activities that you do on Azure, there's a log as well, and that's 90 days. Um, so there are other reasons as well, like you actually own the data, right? For reasons of, uh, you know, this is one thing that I, is very close to my heart, right? You know, my, by me or by you using Azure, right? It doesn't mean that Azure owns everything, right? So that data is in the uh, subscription agreement itself. You know, the customer actually owns that data, right? So I would want that data and I would want to do, I would want to know that I have the freedom to do whatever I want with it, right? So that's one thing. And uh, the other thing that I want to do is maybe uh, I want to reconsult my cost, right? If, you know, I get this amount in my, in my bill and the bill says I, or I got this, you know, 50,000 transactions. Yeah, and then I want to know that, you know, the transactions are, uh, are tracked at what time and, and, and whatnot, right? And, yeah, you may have your reasons as well. So, so let's look at how, how I actually get this data from that, uh, you know, that's actually looking like a chart now from Azure, right? So before we move on further into that note part of things, uh, I actually explored you doing this with uh, Azure um, uh, Storage, right? There is, for some services, you can actually just use diagnostic logs, diagnostic settings to just tell uh, the service, you know, tell Azure to uh, route these logs to Azure Storage, keep it there for archival purposes, right? Unfortunately, I can't find Azure Storage here, so... <laughs> Uh, so then uh, I, went to, uh, I went to look for the documentation and in the documentation I cannot find any uh, blob storage uh, diagnostic logs available. Okay, so I look at platform metrics and I actually found platform metrics uh, and I actually found transactions being part of platform metrics. So now I need to dig out that platform metrics from Azure, right? And JavaScript to the rescue, okay? So, yeah, so that's one uh, adventure I had as a, as a Node developer. So, I use this uh, particular package called uh, Azure Arm Monitor. So, the Azure SDK is actually super comprehensive. You can actually have uh, one for most of the, uh, practically almost all of the services that's actually there. And, and all of that is, 
is actually on the Azure documentation as a REST API as well. So this packages actually wraps around the, the REST API and it gives a convenient uh, kind of like a package that you know, a node developer can use straight away. So yeah, ARM monitor. So these are the couple of uh, objects uh, and classes that uh, are useful to me in, you know, in getting that thing out of Azure portal, right? Uh, so yeah, as all node developers do, I go start myself in, uh, with the NPM uh, page of the package that I want to use, okay? And going there, I get to this page and I see actually that uh, MS REST note off is actually pretty useful. Um, but I don't really want to do interactive login. Okay, as you can see, right, uh, there are many ways to authenticate a user. So interactive login is uh, a very useful way if, if you know, we're just testing some things on the, on the terminal, right? So what it does is, when you do this, right, and you run node, uh, wherever this is, index.js for this uh, snippet of this sample code, uh, what happens is uh, a line pops out, there's a URL there, and then there's like a, something like a code there, right? So you click the URL, you put in the code on the browser, and magically your, your node uh, app uh, gets uh, an authenticated uh, signal from uh, Azure, and you, know, you get to run your code. Um, but I don't want to do this, right? Because I have to host my code on some cron job on the cloud somewhere. So what I want is, uh, yeah, it's actually this, right? So how do I figure out what can I do, right? So this is another cool thing that I really love, which is uh, Visual Studio Code, and uh, particularly IntelliSense, right? So uh, I have MS REST node off there for me, and I know that I can use that to log in, but I have no idea what method name is called, right? So, you know, as per, you know, the magic of IntelliSense, I type in login, and then suddenly, you know, these things appear. And now I know that, oh, okay, cool. I can actually log in with, uh, yeah, maybe service principal, you know, that sounds like it, yeah. Service principal, you know, uh, with service principal, I don't need to key in my, I don't need to be authenticated with a browser. So uh, with that, uh, I'm actually just, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, I can even actually go further, right? If I finish type, if I tap that and then, you know, the documentation is actually in the editor itself, right? And, you know, this is really cool. But uh, reading the documentation is also just pointing me to service principle, which I know already. But yeah, thanks for, you know, telling me in any, any case in that sense. But uh, so now, now I know that I need the service principle. So, uh, so I'm going to segue a little bit to uh, Azure CLI, right? So I'm going to use the CLI to get my service principle. I can, there, are, there are many other ways, but uh, this is what I do. So log in to Azure uh, command line. And uh, the next thing is I want to list my subscriptions. So I just want to emphasize how important it is uh, to do this, right? Because um, for me, I have many subscriptions. I mean, not that many at one time, but you know, I go, uh, but there's at least three lying around, right? Um, so I would want to make sure that this service principle is created for the right subscription, because if I do get the wrong service principle to the right, uh, to the wrong uh, resource, uh, then you know, my code is going to error, right? So here, uh, always, always specify the subscription ID when creating this. So what I'm doing here is I'm just using uh, the Azure CLI to create a service principle for, the, for our back purposes, okay? So then I get my credentials here. So with these credentials, I can uh, actually go back to my code, right? And, you know, go along the way. So the next thing that I find from the sample code that is useful is this. I mean, I read the sample code, right? And I don't need to actually read that far. So, because the next one seems irrelevant to me, list by resource group. So, yeah, it's like, you know, it's auto scale, right? So, I'm not actually interested in auto scale, I'm interested in metrics. So, but I learned from here that, you know, client, uh, this monitor management client is, is pretty interesting and it, it may be very useful to me. So, uh, I instantiate that. And again, I use IntelliSense to guide my way, right? Uh, so, you know, I go through this list and I found that, oh, that's metrics. And metrics 
dot actually has a method called list. Okay, that sounds interesting, right? Client matrix list, right? So, yeah, I can actually IntelliSense my way further. <laughs> but sometimes, uh, this is another way of dealing with things, right? I, I find that it's, uh, it's, it's better to just actually look at the code. Why, um, is, let me pause for a minute. Really because um, the code is available to you. This is an NPM package, right? The moment I do this in Visual Studio Code, right? Visual Studio Code, I can just do, uh, does this for me already. I mean, I can actually just command click on list and look at the actual code of the package itself to get a deeper understanding of what the, the, the package is doing. And I mean, looking at the documentation is super awesome, right? Like, you know, I don't document my code this way, <laughs> but it looks really nice here. You know, now I, I learned that, oh, I need resource URI. So, so what is this resource URI? So, uh, thinking about it, obviously I want to get a metric from block storage. Uh, I go to my block storage. I, first, I actually went to overview, it's not there. Then I click on properties. Oh, yeah, there's this resource ID there that seems like a resource URI. So, I use that, you know, plonk it into the resource URI. And then, going further, I also need to pass in some metrics list optional params. Uh, reading that, this is like super useful for me too, right? So, you know, Imagine my joy discovering this. Okay, this is possible. So now I get, uh, from metrics, I get to specify the time span that I want the metrics uh, for. I get to specify the interval, the time grain. I get to specify the metrics that I'm interested in. In this case, it's transactions. And I know there's a list of other stuff that I get to kind of like filter my query on, right? So, yeah, running that, I actually get to this, right? So if you look at the options I'm passing in, there's metric names. This is comma separated, so if you want something else, uh, you can just put a comma there and have another metric. The metric, uh, the possible metrics, you know, you can actually check on the, the uh, Azure website, the, the Azure documentation for, for blob service, right? And I'm actually here filtering for uh, get blob. So I say API name equals get blob. So with this uh, call, what I get is this return, okay? <laughs> Which is, again, like, you know, I, I was super excited when I saw this because this is exactly what I want, right? Imagine my chart there, you know, all the time spans, and it's super easy to use because, uh, okay, this is not a very good view of this. So, <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, the JSON formatted, uh, formatted JSON of uh, the, the, the object that you saw just now. So yeah, I can actually just use that time series uh, array and, you know, store that into my table. Wow, you know, that's fast. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of attributes here. So time span is one. I need to know the time span that is, uh, that is being returned of the time series that's being returned to me, right? So yeah, doing a little bit of dissection here. So I realized that this is from 5.37 to 6.37, one hour and that the, grain, the granularity is per minute, right? So I get minute level granularity of that get blob count, okay? So with that, let's move on. Uh, I realized that, you know, looking at this, right, there's, you know, a lot of empty objects. If you look at here, right, uh, some of these objects have a total and some does not, right? So I realized that, hey, I don't really need those objects that has no count, right? Because uh, if I store only those objects with count, then you know I get even more cost efficiency with my table storage. So yeah, so then I start filtering it. You know, so I, I'm just using a very simple array filter here. Uh, you know, passing in if the object has a total, then then I con then I put it into my real matrix, right? So real matrix is the uh, the the final uh, look of things, right? Real matrix has uh, an array of uh, time uh, uh, array of object that has a timestamp and uh, the count of that minute that the timestamp represents. Okay, so so I, I'm actually uh, actually has achieved what I wanted to do here. So the next step is where I actually put this into table storage and and here I show how easy it is to actually use a table storage as well. So um, the first thing to do obviously is to go to my portal and create. A, a table that to store this. 
I can actually do this with uh, the Node API as well, but I'm not going to use the Node API because simply this is just two clicks away and I'm doing this one time, <laughs> right? Uh, well, of course, you can use the API if it's repeatable or if you want to do something that you can deploy repeatably. Um, but anyway, the portal is really convenient and it's there for you. So the flexibility is there. So with that um, table there, I actually went on to dis uh, discover or look for, hey, what's the SDK that I use, right? And I realized that, okay, I can't use the version 10, the latest uh, generation of the storage SDK, really because it doesn't really have table support yet, right? So then uh, I moved to the uh, next available one, which is V2, okay? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so that's the flexibility of uh, JavaScript, right? Um, so from that uh, V2, I discovered that these three, um, these three objects help, right? Tab uh, the, the Azure object, obviously, uh, the table service itself created from the, uh, from the Azure, and uh, this NGen object, right? The NGen actually helps with uh, specifying the right data types for the table. Okay, so here's where the meat is. How do I insert that object into uh, Azure Table Service? So what I do here is simply I run through my, my matrix array. I use uh, that, uh, the objects in the metric array to create a new entity. Um, and this entity has a proper uh, indicative, uh, I mean a proper data type indicated uh, to Table Service. Right, so my total is uh, integer, and my metric time is actually a time. So this is the this ensures that data ta uh, the table service understands uh, my intended data type. So next, what I do is I then insert entity into the downloads table, and yep, I get that entity into table storage, and yeah, that's how easy it is to really use uh, the Azure SDK. Um, so the message from today, my you know, what I'm trying to bring across today is that uh, from a node perspective, it's really useful. Uh, it gives you something beyond uh, the portal, and it's really easy. Uh, there's a comprehensive API for Azure that you know, as a node developer, you can use, and if you have codified that, it can be reused, and uh, the APIs. Uh, wrapped by some uh, npm packages that are easily you know npm install and there are friendly storages that are out there uh, such as table service that you can use to persist if you need to persist and you probably need to persist uh, these days right you know creating apps these days so um, I hope you take away uh, some of those key messages and if you want to look f uh, further um, there's some suggestions from me um, you may want to take the example from today and maybe post it on some uh, serverless compute which my colleague uh, Darren Evans is going to show in the next presentation. Um, you may want to sync your table storage to your local storage or anywhere else just for the sake of liberty <laughs> or you know, just to exercise your liberty. And uh, you may want to check out like, some of those uh, Azure extensions on VS Code and uh, maybe play around with blockchain. Uh, which is another cool thing that uh, Microsoft is coming out with uh, a lot. Um, yeah, so some references here. Thank you for your time. Darren. <laughs>